Welcome to the Dental Billing Academy podcast, powered by ESS Dental Solutions. Hey, welcome to the Dental Billing Academy podcast. I am here again with Lois Banta, who we had on one of the very first episodes of the Dental Billing Academy podcast. Welcome back, Lois. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be back. We're very excited to have you back. Uh, I knew that you would be a recurring guest, so I foresaw this coming. And then along with Lois, we have Allison Norris, who is a hygienist and a consultant as well. And what we're going to be talking about today is the D4346 versus D4341 and 4342. So this is a fun coding episode that we're going to be talking about. Um, But we'll start off with Allison, since we've introduced Lois before, and we'll obviously let Lois uh, introduce herself again for anybody that doesn't know her. But Allison, let's start with you on a little bit of your background and just about you. Okay, great. Thank you so much for having me, Amanda. Um, I am a hygienist, as Amanda said, and I graduated in 2007. Um, I absolutely love hygiene. I love being able to provide patients with, you know, optimal care, uh, comprehensive care that they deserve. Um, I started working with eAssist in November. It was when I first got my my assignment, and I absolutely love it. I love being able to work from home and uh, stay home with my children. It's it's been amazing. So thank you. Great. And then Lois, for anybody that doesn't know who you are, which I think is like nobody, but just in case, (laughs) tell everybody a little bit about yourself. So I am a practice management consultant, uh, started, um, I had a a company for about 23 years and recently sold my consulting company to eAssist and have become the um, chief consulting officer for this amazing company and recruited people like Allison to consult practices on the, you know, improving their bottom line and the business practices and all things involved with running a successful business and maybe uh, setting goals to have a little less stress, better bottom line and a little less stress. I've lectured for many, many years. I'm still out there lecturing like crazy. I love what I do. It doesn't feel like work. And to be able to share knowledge, especially partnering with with people within ESS to share the knowledge and the benefits of um, that knowledge, that's a a win-win, I think. Definitely. And so glad that you recruited Allison. Allison is the one that had the idea for this code specific podcast, wanting to speak specifically about some of the tougher hygiene codes that um, dental billers maybe struggle with, but then also uh, hygienists may be struggling with. Mm -hmm. So let's start off um, Allison and Lois with, with just you all explaining um, what is D4346? Um, so back in the day, um, 4346, I used to call a Profi Plus. Um, and so what they did was they developed this code and it's for patients that have um, severe to moderate inflammation. It's scaling in the presence of severe to moderate or moderate to severe inflammation um, without connective tissue loss and without bone loss. Um, so this wow. code is, is great. It can be utilized for patients that have gingivitis or pseudo pocketing, which is just, um, you know, uh, it's essentially just false pocketing. So um, it can be related to to hormone changes. It can be related to medications. Um, And this code is um, is perfect for patients that that have um, some inflammation that's beyond just a regular cleaning, but isn't yet a, you know, in need of a scaling and root planning because there isn't any bone loss or connective tissue loss. So that's a perfect explanation. Scaling and root planning in the presence of gingival inflammation, it's not full blown 4341 and 4342, which of course is scaling and root planning for either a full quadrant or a partial quadrant. Uh, 4346 would be, uh, maybe the patient needs two appointments. So 4346 would be to remove that, that 
plaque and stuff that's in the way of being able to even do a proper exam. And then the second final prophy, would you be able to do the fine scale and um, then follow up with that exam? So this, like you were saying, Allison, so I remember um, and have, I remember the very first time this happened, but then it has happened several times since then where a hygienist came up and said, patient so-and-so needs to be scheduled for a difficult prophy Mm -hmm. for an hour and a half or two hours. And so essentially, is that what you're referring to when you say prophy plus? So these are those patients um, that, like you said, uh, Lois, that need to have all of that buildup and calculus um, maybe removed, um, before the actual prophy is, is done. And yes. exam, because you, you can't do a formal periodontal measurements when you have all that stuff in the way you're not going to get accurate measurements. And so, and especially when they have inflamed gum tissue, like Allison was talking about, you try to do your perio probing and it's not going to give you an accurate number. So you got to remove all that debris first. And then the second appointment, and you would document that you started an exam, but you wouldn't bill out the exam till the second final profi appointment. Okay. So for any of the clinicians uh, listening, so that explanation was great and gives a pretty, uh, pretty clear cut um, separation between the two D4346 and D4341. But for uh, dental billers and the clinicians uh, as well, because they really need to work as a team in order to get these uh, claims sent out cleanly and with the correct information, what type of information is needed uh, first off to, to determine that it's a, a 4346, but then to send that claim to get that paid? So we want to make sure that, um, you know, we have a full comprehensive periodontal evaluation. We don't want just numbers, you know, um, and also it's very, very important to, you know, notate the bleeding points and areas where there's some separation, which is a very, you know, nice term of saying pus, um, or, you know, you also want to notate any vacation involvement, the recession, um, and then that determines your, uh, clinical attachment loss, um, because clinical attachment loss is the, um, the, uh, recession and pocket depths added together. Um, you want to make sure that you have diagnostic radiographs that show whether there's bone loss and connect connective tissue loss present. Um, a lot of times for my patients that, uh, that, have perio or whether they are not yet, you know, to that, to that point of having full blown perio, we want vertical bite wings because you're able to see the tooth better and you're able to see that bone loss a lot better. And in addition to that, Amanda, um, what I, what I would recommend in addition to that is intraoral images. So before Mm -hmm. uh, the procedure commences, you can take photographs of the swollen gum tissue and the bleeding points, et cetera. And then uh, at that second appointment, when you've got lots of healing and the gums are not no longer swollen, et cetera, a post um, appointment intraoral image, all of those supporting documentation, um, Uh, methods are going to help get the claim process the first time correctly. And that's really what we're going through is it's not about utilizing a code to get a procedure covered by insurance. It's about supporting the why behind the what and documentation and images, whether they're radiographs or intraoral images support the why. And that's what insurance reviewers are looking for. That's great information. And so if there are offices that the dental billers listening right now are thinking, well, I have never billed that code because the hygienist has never stated that that was the procedure needed or, um, I, you know, maybe thinking they've told me that there's a tough profi and that's what we schedule. But now I realize that we could be billing out for the 4346. Um, there are probably uh, hygienists out there that are a little bit um, scared maybe of the 40 of 4346 uh, or unsure of how to diagnose that and what 
proper documentation that they need. So the explanations that you've given have been fantastic. Um, but for the offices where that is happening, how can the dental billers and the front desk and administrative staff really help support the dentist and the hygienist in, in that why, like you were talking about Lois in getting that why for the what to send to the dental insurance? I think it's very, very important to have an open communication and um, a team mentality in a dental practice. So, you know, even if it takes having a, a you know, I'm, I'm a big proponent of having full team meetings and everyone being able to give their feedback and, you know, having that open communication, because if one person doesn't understand it, and if one person isn't on board, then that can kind of upset the whole apple cart, if, if you know what I'm saying. So you want everyone to kind of be on the same page. And if the hygienist says, you know, this patient is a more difficult prophy, um, they need to have, you know, a scaling and presence of inflammation, um, then, then we can explain to them uh, explain to the front desk, explain, ex, you know, to the front office, to the front staff, um, what is needed to go along with that. And, and in turn, the, you know, hygiene team, the clinical team needs to also be aware of what is needed. So if the radiographs aren't as diagnostic as they should be, then they may just have to retake radiographs. Or if you can't see, um, you know, bone level, uh, as well, then they may have to take that horizontal radiograph that they took, that horizontal bite wing that they took, and then, you know, take a, a vertical bite wing instead. Um, now, and that would be in regards to, you know, for scaling and root planning patients, but, um, you know, for them, for everyone to be on the same page is key, I guess, is, uh, is kind of just sum that up. So, yeah. And in addition to that, um, sometimes the radiographs being two dimensional are not going to show the evidence as much as describing it in a detailed narrative or taking an intraoral image that where you may be able to take a, a lingual photograph of what's going on in the mouth. Um, any supporting information, that's what the SCs can really drive the point home with the dental offices is the more is better, less is not better. Mm -hmm. So the more you detail it out. So if the radiographs don't show the 100% conclusive evidence, then you want to make sure that you template and note that you can customize to meet the patient's diagnostic needs and really support it through the, through the words on the page, so to speak. And then in like a triple whammy would be the intraoral image. So you want radiographs, into our image and you want a detailed explanation of why this diagnosis was there. Also careful explanation um, in your team meetings about answering those patient questions. Basic questions gonna come up is, will my insurance cover that? And that's, you know, that's the million dollar question because some insurances cover it and some don't, but it's not why you build a code. You build a code because it's the appropriate code for the circumstance surrounding what the patient needs. Absolutely. Definitely. We don't want insurance to ever dictate the treatment that the patient's getting. And then as uh, Dr. Shelburne explained in the last episode, that while this is a code that has been around for, uh, I think, two years now. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. While it's been around for two years, there may be some insurances that the patient's plan, it's not listed as a covered code on the plan because their HR department did not uh, renew the mm -hmm. Uh, to an, a newer plan that included any of the new CDT codes and is still operating on the original planned uh, covered codes. So these new codes that are approved by the CMC are not grandfathered in to existing plans. The HR department actually has to renew that. So um, do not assume just because the code is two years old, it's still fairly new. There could be insurance plans that your patients have that it's not a covered benefit um, so double check that, you know, with the insurance so that you can accurately give them that treatment plan. Um, because like Lois said, we don't want the insurance to, to dictate yeah. or patients get upset because they were told it would be covered when it's really not a covered benefit. Always best to explain to the patient 
that um, the design of your plan does not dictate how we diagnose your treatment. Um, we diagnose the dentistry that is in your best interest. It may or may not be covered by your plan. You may want to check with your HR department. And just so um, that so everyone knows on this call, best way to communicate is that um, employers dictate what is and isn't included in a dental benefit plan. It's not the insurance companies. This is one case where they're really not the bad guys. That's the employer. If they if they want their premiums to stay low, then they exclude a lot of codes that would typically be covered. Right. And if you would like that, um, what what was it? Um, Lois, the exact wording, the design. The design of your plan may may limit what your insurance pays. I have actually, if anybody wants to order that from me, it's free. Right. Um, I have a sign that um, you can hang right on your wall that says, you know, dear yeah. patient, the design of your plan may pay differently in this office. Yeah. Or it may just, limit what your insurance pays. Just email podcast at eassist.me and I'll shoot you that over yeah. because- um, That's a good one. <laughs> yep. Lois is providing that as a free resource to any dental offices that would like to have it because it is worded beautifully and very helpful. Yeah. I, I, got, I got a lot of stuff in my, in my wheelhouse. So <laughs> happy to share that. Great. Okay. So if the dental biller and the hygienist have um, gotten all of this documentation, it sent it with a claim for 4346 um, or let me back up. They've sent it with a uh, all of the necessary information for a claim for D4341 and the insurance downgrades to a D4346 based on the clinical documentation. Um, is that an acceptable or if the if it 4341 is, is denied altogether, can the 4346 be asked um, to be considered as an alternate benefit? I wouldn't typically recommend a 4346 as an alternate benefit. I would recommend you fight like heck to get that 4341. And my guess, if I were guessing why a claim gets denied, it's because that not enough detailed narrative was supplied to support the 4341 diagnosis. If you just send x-rays and maybe even the charting, but you don't send a detailed narrative attached to that, the chances of getting that claim processed as a, a true 4341 lesson. So um, uh, I've said this so many times, obnoxious detail wins out every single time. The more detailed and the less guessing the insurance reviewer has to do, um, the better the claim will get processed accurately. So in my opinion, and I'm sure Allison's opinion, uh, processing a 4341 and downcoding it to a 4346 is an error on the insurance company's part, but also an error on the dental office's part that they didn't supply enough detailed information. Absolutely. But that's why we have a protocol, right? Right. right? That's why you need one. Absolutely. I completely agree. I completely agree because, you know, once, like I say, once a perio patient, always a perio patient. So, if a perio patient is in is in need of you know 4341 or 4342, that means that they have full blown periodontal disease with bone loss and supported you know co connective tissue loss, and um, so we want them to be able to um, to to be able to you know be a periodontal maintenance patient, so we can see them more frequently, and also um, you know we want we want the most comprehensive care for our patients and we want um, for every one of our patients to have optimal health. And the only way of being able to do that is, you know, filing what needs to be filed and not, um, not up coding and not down coding right. um, from what is actually, you know, needed for that particular patient. And, um, to add to Allison's comment, a 4346 is not a precursor to follow-up appointments being 4910. A 4910 is always tied to scaling and replanning, but the 4346 is kind of like its own standalone code. Mm -hmm. Follow-up visits would either be another 4346 or a 1110 profi. It's a precursor to the possibility the patient needs scaling and replanning. Right, Allison? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. I wonder, I'm not the hygienist. You are, but I'm a coder and I know stuff. <laughs> Exactly. Um, we actually have a couple of other people on the call too. This is a uh, fun. We have some people joining this podcast live. Um, so I would like to ask right now, if anybody joining live uh, has 
uh, an, an opinion, would like to weigh in with some feedback, or maybe has a question for any of the panelists. So we have Charity. Um, I always feel like I'm going to say your last name incorrectly, Charity. Can you say Taban. One? Taban. There we go. Joining us, who is also uh, a hygienist uh, and a fantastic dental biller as well. Um, Charity, you can take, you know, a, a few seconds to kind of tell us about your background in dentistry and then jump in with your question, feedback, opinion, whatever you have for us. Sure thing. So yes, my name is Charity Taban. I've actually been actively in the dental field, still a current hygienist for 20 years now. And I joined ESS five years ago, so I got to learn even more about the dental billing side, which in turn ultimately helped me be a better hygienist. So to kind of caveat with both Allison and with Lois, it's really important to have these team meetings that everyone understands how everything works. Uh, to be able to tell the people up the front what they need from a hygienist and the hygienist can tell them what they're seeing. So then that way they can bill appropriately. It's going to maximize the oral health of those patients because that's what offices are there for. You know, that's what dentists are there for. We want to bring everybody to optimum oral health, which as we all know in turn is optimum body health. <laughs> you know? right. so we always want to make sure that we are, you know, bringing the, the, all that to our offices and to our patients. Thank you so much, Charity. Yeah, thank you. Thank I almost you, feel Charity. like we should call this episode like two hygienists and a Lois. <laughs> yes, we've got it sandwiched perfectly. I have such an appreciation for the knowledge base that hygienists bring to the table on the practice management side. Um, and that's why, and I'm going to reiterate the thirdly, that team meetings are, they play a, such a crucial role in consistency in how we treat our patients and with um, what procedures we're offering to our patients. When we have a protocol, something in writing that when this is exhibiting, this is the code we're gonna use. When this is present, this is the code we're gonna use. And then you can document and template uh, detailed narratives that match the treatment plan that you're offering to that patient. That is a great marriage. And then when you take the administrative team's business talents on the coding and billing, to the insurance side, now you've got the perfect marriage. I absolutely agree. Great. Well, I always like to ask this every episode. And so we'll start with you, Allison, um, to give Lois a little bit of time to think uh, about a different nugget of wisdom than she gave on the first episode of the Dental Billing Academy. So um, Allison, what for dental billers out there, um, and this can be related to what we were talking about, or it can be something different. Um, but what nugget of wisdom do you have for just all dental billers everywhere moving forward uh, from today on in their workplace? Guess I would say um, get as much documentation as possible. Make sure that um, what you're documenting is, you know, what is written in the clinical notes and what is performed. Um, by the dentist or the hygienist, whoever the provider is, um, you know, making sure that uh, radiographs are up to date, perio charting is up to date, um, and not just in terms of, you know, for, for your hygiene team, but as well as, you know, your doctors, making sure that, um, you know, your radiographs that um, you're sending for a crown are recent radiographs, up-to-date radiographs, um, making sure that if you are using a note template that you're not just copying, pasting the mm -hmm. same exact um, note and narrative for every patient across the board because sending the insurance company, um, you know, the narrative recurrent decay um, you know, a regular margin for a crown, um, eventually the, the insurance company may end up getting flagged, you know, that, that they, or the doctor's office may end up getting flagged by the, by the, uh, insurance company. And so you just want to make sure that whatever you're submitting is, um, is up to date and accurate and, um, you know, as detailed as possible. And my nugget of information to add to what Allison said, um, what I want, what I want teams to remember is that systems are the crucial element 
that will, that's the glue that holds everything together. Communication is the cherry on top of the Sunday. So how you say what you say matters, but how you detail it out also matters. And what Allison was saying in making sure you just don't have a canned narrative, insurance companies recognize that they will kick the claim out and most likely put a practice on focus review is if, if the narrative is, is too generic. So template your narrative, but create an opportunity to customize each one of those narratives for the patient's experience, for the patient's diagnosis and treatment plan. And that's what I'm talking about in a systematic approach. You've got to have a systematic approach to everything, your team meetings, your morning huddles, your documentation processes, and then your communication between your outsourced um, company like eAssist and the dental practice. That has to marry very well together. And that's where the communication cherry on top of the Sunday aspect comes into play. We want the dental practices to be successful. The dental practices want their claims paid. In order to do that, we have to talk well with each other. We have to play nice in the sandbox with each other. That's my nugget. Thank you so much. Those are both great nuggets. And I appreciate you both um, joining me for this podcast episode. This was tremendously helpful. Uh, For anyone that has any questions for either Lois or Allison regarding what we talked about today, you can email me at podcast at eassist.me. Or if what we were talking about got very, very um, confusing because of all the codes we were throwing around, I will actually be more than happy to provide you um, a very simple explanation of the different codes and what Allison and Lois both went over that you can hang up at your front desk or put next to your computer that will help you to remember um, what's needed with a 4346 um, when it's not okay for it to be an alternate benefit and things like that. Um, as As always, if you would like to follow us on Facebook or Instagram, just search Dental Billing Academy. And then if you would like to join one of these podcasts live, and jump in and talk with the panelists like Charity did, then just email me again, podcast at eassist.me, and we'll get you invited to the next uh, podcast episode because it's a lot of fun. It is. Always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Click subscribe now to never miss an episode and find us on Facebook to expand your network.